acting or raising the spirits of the dead. We don't know what happened there when Saul went and wanted to talk to the spirit of David. That's the only documentation really where there is a disconnect. But otherwise we are an integrated whole. And N.T. Wright strongly believes, and he's got scripture to prove uh, the way he looks at it, as somebody would say, that when we are raised up from the dead, we are raised up not as disembodied souls that are floating around, but actually as people. And the resurrected body of Christ is an example of that, that he could be touched. He, he was not a spirit that was floating around. But the notion that we have of souls floating around and an embodiment or an insolvent of the body uh, is possibly erroneous. If you have controversies scripturally and spiritually, there's enough controversies biologically as well. How do we define human? Is it by chromosomes? Is it by biochemistry? Is it by structure? Is it by function? All of these are flawed. <coughs> because you can have a normal chromosome, yet be only a mole, a molar pregnancy, where there are no structures. You can have normal structure, but not have a functional brain. Uh, there, there can be all sorts of nuances within uh, fetal medicine to tell us that uh, definitions are not easy for anyone. So where do we give the value to the fetus? Uh, is it an inherent value? Yes, there is something of that. Is it an endowed or attributed value? Is the mother the one who decides there's value to my baby? Or is it society? How do we go about deciding uh, who decides what is? In fetal medicine, we have to give the mother the autonomous choice. They say, yes, do you want me to take on this fetus as a patient? Or do you want to say, no, you know, I don't want treatment, I want to terminate. Um, legally, it is considered an assault if I treat a mother without her consent. Um, so there are difficulties in all of this. So termination of pregnancy becomes a little bit of a difficult issue to look at. What we know for sure is that Bible does not clearly and explicitly address this issue. What we know this is that Christians have divergent views on the interpretation of key passages in the Bible. What we also know is that we differ on how to interpret key passages. And we also know that there are ethical dilemmas and Christians are not the best in navigating complex ethical issues. Now, I'm not talking about social terminations at all. Social terminations is an evil in society where a mother can demand termination because it's a, it's, she didn't have the right contraception or um, it's an inconvenient time. I'm talking about fetal abnormalities and where some children have not just limb deformities but have serious cardiac, intracranial, or abdominal problems and mothers choose not because they want to, but because they are caught on the horns of a dilemma, a much wanted, much loved child who they have to favor. There are these key passages, Psalm 139, that we have looked at. Does this reference imply that God has actually had his hand upon it, or is it a foreknowledge of God? Jeremiah 1 5, I knew you before you were formed in your mother's. Boom. Is it foreknowledge or is it predestination? That's the reference to John, you know, when Mary and Elizabeth meet together, when uh, John leapt in Elizabeth's womb. Does it give personhood status or is it just about the perception that Elizabeth had at that time? Is termination of pregnancy a murder? Is it wrongful death? Is it uh, an intended whatever, which is what Roe and Wade seem to imply. And then we have one more reference where two people are actually engaged uh, and a pregnant mother gets in between and um, she gets a miscarriage. Uh, is that murder? Uh, the Bible does not seem to indicate that. Ethical issues. Again, you know, the uh, Western uh, medical way of looking at things is not clearly the only way of looking at it. We are a multicultural nation, especially in Australia. Religion ethics have a huge amount of interactions to do. We have African populations, we have Islamic people, we have Buddhists, 
Um, I looked after a mother whose baby was definitely going to die, but she was a Buddhist, and she said, there's no way I will think of a termination. So we looked after her pregnancy. I'm not that we were offering her termination. We looked after her pregnancy, had the baby, baby lived for a few weeks, and then died. Uh, she, was, she was actually a very joyful person uh, who went through the whole pregnancy uh, with much forbearance. I've had Christians who've come to me with very easily treatable conditions who have not wanted to continue the pregnancy, and I'm not being judgmental at this point in time. It's a choice that each uh, parent makes, and uh, I think religion has very little to do with what a mother will do in pregnancy. We are also governed by medical legal aspects of saying, yes, this is what you have to tell a mother, these are the options that you have to give her, these are the choices that you have um, to fulfill uh, professional uh, competence. And of course, consumerism and threat of legal action is always there. And Katie, I'm sorry, some of my colleagues might have been overly um, defensive in counseling you and uh, giving you more anxiety than what you needed. Uh, I tend to uh, be more normalizing pathology, and I stand, uh, I run the very real danger of uh, missing things and being told that uh, you didn't tell us that. Uh, whereas my colleagues, so especially one of them, has the risk of creating so much of anxiety and um, worry among parents when half of it is really not going to happen, or more than half of it. Um, society, in general, grasped at a notion of perfection which would exclude pain and suffering due to disease, death, and the impact of evil in an imperfect <coughs> world. And this is what we are going towards. And uh, believe me, I mean, we are at the threshold of a genetic revolution that will happen sooner or later. How do I look at myself? It's an opportunity for me to join the, together, working together, working as fellow workers with God, to the en enhancement of what is imperfect, what is fallen, what is broken, if possible. We do accept the imperfections of life, and we associate with imperfection of knowledge. The genetic revolution is upon us, sooner or later. The major changes are afoot in the science of screening, diagnosis, and management of prenatal in the prenatal setting. Christian doctors and Christian families will have to find a way forward, somehow or the other, because it's only going to become a jungle out there genetic jungle. How do I look at it? I think we have to find a third way. Not the legalistic way, not the moral way. One way is to say, yes, we need to do it. Second is to run away from it and say, no, this is all evil. But can we find a third way of embracing it and saying what is right about it and what is not right about it and find a transformative, redemptive way which is what Jesus did when the woman who was caught in adultery was brought to her. She could have been stoned and that would have been the right thing to do. He could have forgiven her and said, you know, look, let her go. That would have been the right thing to do. But no, he took his time. I don't know what he wrote in the mud, but he wrote something. And there was an effect on everybody who was standing there. The older ones leaving first and the younger ones all dropping the stones that they had in their hands. Can we have some kind of an influence of that nature towards our colleagues, towards the departments where we work, so that there is a transformative change in outlook towards what is afoot to, to us? Indeed, when we walk to the edge of all the light we have and take that step into the darkness of the unknown, we must believe that one of two things will happen, that we will find something solid to stand on, or we will be taught to fly. I think we are all still learning to fly. Thank you for listening. And thank you, Katie, and the little baby Nathan, and all the other families who make the ground that we work on holy, not just at the matter, but every workplace becomes holy. Thanks to my family, friends from church and region allowing me to ask questions. Thanks, Paul. And 
my family. And, and Dai, who made these slides, interesting. I think I was asked to put this slide up. Thank you so much. Um, and a special thank you, um, Katie and the baby Nathan, for coming today. I think having a baby in the room just really reminds us of the preciousness of, um, of a new life. You certainly have um, given us a lot to reflect and to think about. And what's going to happen is Paul Mercer is going to come around and he has um, some clipboards. So if people want to just form groups, and just have a little bit of a talk about some of the um, thoughts and questions that you might have. And if there is a direct question that you would like to ask um, Dr. Joseph, you would like to write that down and then we will give it to him and he'll have a few minutes to think about it and respond to those questions. So you've got about five minutes to have a talk. Um, you can reflect um, or Think of some questions. Thank you so much. Sure, we've got a few people around here. Have a conversation. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>
I think uh, I'll answer the last question first. Um, that's very scriptural, isn't it? The first shall be last, and the last shall be first. Um, this is a question about follow up for women who choose termination in cases of disability. Um, they actually get less follow up than the woman who decides to continue the pregnancy because the woman who continues the pregnancy is surrounded by all kinds of support services. But the woman who terminates the pregnancy has um, a couple of follow-ups called as from bereavement services. Um, and uh, I think most tertiary institutions will make a follow-up appointment about six to eight weeks after the event for parents to come back and ask questions as to what happened, why it happened, whether it will happen again in the next pregnancy, and all of that. What is not fully addressed is grief. And grieving, whether the parents continue the pregnancy or whether they terminate, grief is real. For the ones who do not terminate, it's the 
challenges of ongoing needs that need to be met for the one who has terminated. It's the guilt and the grief of not only the lost life, but also um, the, the problems that were there, where they're real, where they imagined, where the doctor's right. You know, I mean, huge number of questions keep coming up. So we try and keep follow up for a little while, but they don't get as much as they should. That I agree. Now, the more or less the rest of the questions have a similar uh, theme. Um, when does an abnormality in a fetus become sufficient enough to contemplate or justify termination? Uh, I think where we come from as fetal medicine specialists is when there is a abnormality which is lethal, which is very few, I must admit, like a baby without, sorry, KD, but without a brain, um, cannot uh, have a human existence. A baby without two kidneys cannot be born alive and breathe because the lungs don't develop and there are no kidneys. And a few conditions like that, which are lethal. When the baby is born, the baby will die. There are no two ways about it. And of course, uh, one Christian couple really uh, challenged me and said, do you think our God can't make kidneys in my baby? I mean, that's a different question altogether. Um, but those babies won't survive. There are the next set of abnormalities which are severe and uh, may not be compatible with a life for a prolonged period of time. Like even trisomy 13 and 18, which is Edward syndrome and Patel syndrome of different natures, um, those children can sometimes live for a few years, but then they die. Some parents will choose to keep those babies. Some parents say it's too hard for them to have a relationship develop for a short period of time and then to bury their young child. Um, so those are conditions that I have no problem in saying that's up to the parents. But there are other serious and severe abnormalities, brain, cardiac, which needs multiple surgeries, uh, which means compromise um, in terms of quality of life ongoing for the family and for the child, then we give it as an option to the parents. We have cardiologists involved, neurologists involved, who give them detailed description of what will be done for the child after birth and what are the likely complications. And all, almost invariably, almost yet, all the other abnormalities, we tell them that it's repairable, sometimes intervention in pregnancy and sometimes interventions after pregnancy. Some parents will choose to terminate even mild abnormalities, and that's hard for us, both as physicians and as a team uh, that advocate for fetal uh, life. Uh, but again, autonomy trumps us there uh, because it's the mother's choice. At least here, uh, the mother has the freedom. Now, the Queensland laws, which have changed about two or three years ago, a woman can have a termination till 22 weeks on demand uh, till 22 weeks. But after that, a woman needs uh, two doctors to agree that yeah, she's, it's the right thing to do. And sometimes it's hard to find two doctors, but many other times it's not difficult to find when there is an abnormality. Now, there is a question about uh, um, social terminations and you know when uh, contraception fails or not being on contraception. I mean, it's a little bit hard for me to say it's okay or it's not okay. Um, because I was just discussing in this group, there is something biologic about us, all of us. When our heart stops, whether it's me or it's our dog at home, when our heart stops, we die. I believe that there is something in me that is more than uh, my body and that's going to be resurrected in time. Does this happen to all the conceptions which never implanted in the uterus? I don't know. Was it ever a human being? I don't know. Just because there is chromosomes, 46, XY or XX, does it make it a human? Not likely, because that's not the definition of human. There are many ethicists and 
bioethicists and philosophers who think that maybe in plantation is the time when we should say there's a potential for life, not conception. Because that's when the baby is settled in the uterus, sending its roots into the mother's, you know, decidua, endometrium, and is able to make life. Well, maybe that's a point. And there are very good Christians who think that it's neurological activity that should determine the beginning of human life. Otherwise, we are not, you know, we are a lump of flesh, can I say, or organizing tissues. Um, the end of life is defined not usually, you know, of course, if the heartbeat stops and it's finished, it's finished. But if the heartbeat is going on, there's no neurological activity. ECG is flat. You would say the person is dead, even if the heart is beating and their lungs are kept going with the machine. Taking that analogy into the intrauterine life, there are many uh, sound Christian ethicists who think that maybe organized neurological activity from the brain. And that usually happens to be around the 22 week mark, which is also the mark when viability occurs. Is that the point? I don't know, but these are possibilities. But one thing I know for sure, we do share something in common with all the rest of God's creation, all the other animals and plants. That's physiology, that's anatomy, that's embryology. The chick embryo doesn't look anything much different than the human embryo, other than in terms of chromosomes in the very early beginnings. All the mammals have similar embryological patterns in the beginning. Keith, you would know, having studied comparative uh, embryology. Um, but where does it become Imago Dei? Where do we become more than just a mass of cells? I don't know. I think um, I will have to leave that question there. But social termination is just on demand for convenience sake. I think there are so many evils in society that probably will have to be seen as an evil in society. But being polarized about it, being, um, what can I say, militant about it, is not going to be the third way. We have to find a redemptive way. <laughs> yeah, uh, of course, there is a question here which, which is really an important question. If a mother decides to terminate a baby's life after the baby is born, would that be accepted? That's a very good question. Any child that's killed after birth is murder, legally. But we do have an exception to this where we put into place something called as a perinatal palliative care plan. That's not murder. But some people would call it murder. When there are babies that are severely affected or born 